I've been thinking a lot these days about a man named Archie Singham. He wrote a seminal piece of observations about Caribbean politics and it's titled, The Hero and the Crowd in a Colonial Polity. And he was talking largely about, at that time, Grenada, but he had passed through the Caribbean and was observing the phenomenon of this one man at a microphone or on a platform and a large crowd and that was the nature of the politics. And he thought it was transitional, I think. I think this was the period leading to independence. And obviously, one would assume that by the time you get to independence, you begin to sort out the relationship between people and power. I don't think Dr. Singham would have imagined in 2013 that we would be back to one man in a crowd, not even an executive. Interim this, interim that, and we are lapping it up, and we ask ourselves, how we get here? Now, when we think about the people, we really have to go far back in history. But I don't want to go all the way there tonight. Because I'm here, I want to talk, I want to start a little bit with Cipriani and Butler because they were the genesis of organized labor. And I think that they found their confidence, the confidence that they came back from the British West Indian Regiment with, that, that helped Cipriani in the first instance organize a dock strike. They, they found their confidence after fighting to represent Britain in the war. They were co colonials and were not deemed qualified to fight alongside the British, and because of their insistence, they formed the British West Indian Regiment. And that was so important because when you look at the people who were in that regiment and saw the role they came back in their various islands to play, you, did, you, you understand the power of discovering one's own sense of power. Because they fought and discovered that they were as good as and better than the British, cologne, the British uh, colonels and the sergeants and the this and the that, that they were master strategists. And out in the field of war, there was no first and second class. And so when they came back home and they started to address the issues of inequity and so on, they gave rise ultimately to the modern trade union movement, which I want to argue is the first indigenous institution of political and social mobilization. Now, the value of that point, we understand when we come to independence. Because the burden of my argument tonight is that independence aborted the process <clears throat> of mobilization and, and organization of the population. People who were moving forward throughout the Caribbean, and that's the other thing about it, the labor movement. The labor movement was organizing across the Caribbean. There was a commonality and a recognition of one people who had found their way here. And so the, the notion of solidarities and shared experiences and a shared history and common interests, which are the things that form the, an interest group, was aborted when we went to independence and emerged with a class of leaders who were important, yes, but they were deemed fit to rule by the colonial authorities. And we know in Trinidad what that meant for us. It meant the cutting of, of Butler's rise when, Butler, when the governor chose, even though Butler emerged with the greater number of seats in an election in which many other people ran and got less seats, Butler was denied um, on the prerogative of the, of the governor. I've sometimes wondered what Trinidad might have been like if Butler was allowed. And I think sometimes you, one might consider studying that. He might have been anything. He might have been a great success, a great failure. I have no idea of knowing because we were denied that option by history. Ultimately, with Britain committed to releasing the islands, we came to the point of uh, virtually selected leaders, leaders who one could deal with, but the, the colonial power could deal with. But Williams himself, when he, arrived, when he arrived, was one man and a crowd. 
1958, when he put his bucket down and started his series of lectures in Woodford Square, there was no party. It was a man who was addressing the crowd, electrifying people, mobilizing, you know, their imaginations were running ra ra wild with the possibilities of the future. But in very quick order, he got a party in January, and by September, he was in office as chief minister. And very soon after, with independence, became prime minister. So we arrived at independence with a leader who had arrived at the top, who had not come from the, from the bowels of the population. And I want to make no great um, case for necessarily coming up. Whether or not you come from the top or the bottom, the question is, what does your policy re reflect? Because you can come very much out of the people, and then you get to the top, and you can be totally different. So we're going to just have to judge by the policies that were implemented. And I think in the, the 50 years of independence, the great challenge has been how to transform a system, not, not only the political system, an entire system for managing a country in such a way that it gives itself and its people the best possible chance for engaging the future. We have simply been lucky with oil and gas, and we know that. And anybody who's thinking about managing this country has to think about the day oil and gas runs out. And if you're not prepared for it today, you're already in trouble. And so we had to, be, the challenge of independence coming in at that point had to be, how do we take a, a, a society that had been designed for control and containment. Remember, the institutions of this society were designed by colonial authority. If you are England, you will not organize a society out in the Caribbean for their purposes. You organize it for your purposes. That's common sense. How do you now, taking control of it, transform it so that it comes from here and belongs to us? Now, Mr. Roger repeatedly spoke about the incidence of, what, of corruption, of the large sums of money that are disappearing, being spent, and so on. And he made the point about people <clears throat> not um, I'm battling a virus, so uh, excuse me. Can I get more water, please? He made a point about people not caring enough. But I want to say that that is a symptom of a society that still does not feel it belongs here. It does not believe this place is its own. It is an expression of the alienation that continued from when we were brought here, and it wasn't ours, it became ours and we still don't believe it. Because if we, if we believed it, we will not allow certain things in the place. When we hear that $27 million was spent one night during the, the independence period, of which 15 million must have been in fireworks, right? Because I don't know what else there was. Um, and it, it's like water off a duck's back. It tells us that we don't feel that that is ours. You can't legislate the emotional connection that people can feel to a place. You can't force it. You can't insist on it. You can just nurture it and make it real for them. And so the challenge of independence has always been, how do, you, how do we make ourselves belong in this place? The, one had to have been the political system. How do you transform the political system so that it really is grounded in people? And I want to say that this is where the trade union movement comes, comes in, which is as an indigenous institution of representation which emerged in defiance to the colonial authority. It offers a model for organizing people in the smallest possible unit. So that when you are negotiating, for example, with Petrotrin, whoever, before you can get to that point of what are your proposals you're taking into that room, it's down in the, in the, among the workers that you start examining what are your needs, what it is you want, and so on. You're taking your instructions. That is good unions, because we do have unions that are as top-down as the politics, who've taken their model from something else. But 
in the tradition of the trade union that developed, the marching orders come from below. The leaders come from below. You are a shop steward today, the next day you are the regional whatever, and then you move up and, that, and you're taking with you those memories, those experiences, and you, come, you rise to the top and you know what you're doing, you know the landscape, you know the needs and so on. And so that, that model has not made the transition into the politics. The politics is one man, a crowd, and you wait with anticipation to hear the day when they announce candidates. And you, you really don't know where these candidates come from. You just get long CVs. You know, this one is an MA and a BA and a PhD and so on and so forth. But that is the notion of the crap of politics that we have long grown accustomed to. So the responsibility for transforming the political system to make it one with investment, where people are invested in it, where they belong to it, where it represents them, that has not happened. We have had repeated con uh, reform exercises, constitutional reform exercises. We have one on the way now that I find the most interesting thing is that a supplemental bill went to Parliament the other day asking for 10 million more to serve as that commission. And it's not even a commission, I think it's a committee. 10 million more. And it's process to go around and ask people what they want. People they didn't even attend because people are tired telling you what you want. And so the reform processes are by themselves self-defeating because you can't find out what people want in that way. People have to, the process has to come from the population. And you, they're not going to give it to you at a, at a setting like that. You have to find what is the structure, and, and a lot of it comes to a decentralization of power. And it is almost a no-brainer that power doesn't decentralize itself. If it has power, it is going to try to make it look like decentralization and keep it in check. And so it is almost an ant antithetical um, and a conflict uh, relationship where you want, the population will want the power and those in charge will not want. And so you, you always end up with this aborted process where nothing happens and we wait for another administration and another committee and so on and so forth. So the political transformation has not occurred and today we are in the, the, we are the point where the central issue should go on as well is being termed representation. And representation in that case is being translated to mean the provision of goods and services. That is, if you have somebody who died, I will pay for this. If you want to go to a doctor, I'll pay for this. But that is not representation. I have described that as benevolent despotism, <laughs> which is you don't really have the right to decide with me I make all the decisions, I just give you things and you be quiet and do what I want you to do. Representation is a, a someone who is representing what you decide. They must go out there and represent you to the world in terms of all the things you say you want. You have the right to decide. That is what representation is. So we have a choice of zero, representation, benevolent dictatorship, and yet to be talking about representation. So that's just the politics. A critical part of the transformation process had to have been the education system. We do not have, we are still running a curriculum in this country that first of all invalidates the indigenous knowledge of the, of the people. All over the country, the real knowledge is captured in pockets that are not recognized in the formal system. And the formal system is teaching something irrelevant so that you get all these graduates who are coming out who cannot solve any problem in the country. Well, I don't want to say any, but most of the problems. And so we are preparing clocks over and over, and when we need expertise, we're importing it. Often, we, don't, we import expertise that cannot solve the problems. And there is a great, you know, the racket is that you get the money from an international funding agency, and the majority of the money has to be cycled back out to them for their intelligence and their consultants and their this and that, and they come and they hire local at much lower rate, and they do the work. And so that intellectual imperialism, as it were, is part of